Well, ladies and gentlemen, here we have ourselves again. You are listening to Watch This with Rick Ramos. I am your host, Rick Ramos, flying solo today, talking a little bit about uh, movies and things that interest me, and uh, apparently from the listener base and people who continually turn in time in and time again, all 14 of you, um, there seems to be some kind of uh, connection. So I'm going to keep that going for as long as I possibly can. Um, I released, I recorded a, I recorded an episode yesterday talking about the revisionist westerns and looking at um, a film called Old Old Henry and the latest film from did it from from a filmmaker that I really appreciate that I love that I've uh, that I've been a great admirer of for the last uh, 30, 30 some odd years, Walter Hill and um, Dead for a Dollar left me a little bit it left me feeling a little bit empty like. Uh, it was a missed opportunity. Some fine actors performing in a in a decent uh, uh, idea for a script that just didn't come together. Just just didn't just didn't pull that that sense of, of purpose. That sense of danger. Um, I think I think I described it as such as it was lacking in a it was lacking in a level of danger that I'm that I, I kind of embrace when I watch uh, movies, especially with Walter Hill movies, which many people can dismiss as being ultra masculine um toxic masculinity that types of shit but um i think they're i think they're fine films they're well crafted films that speak to an attitude and a belief um of in some cases what it is to be a man and that's a that's an ever changing definition but um what walter hill is dealing with is definitely something along those lines and hill from some of his, you know, from his first film, 1974's Hard Times with Charles Bronson and James Coburn, I, I think there was a sense of male, male purpose. Um, his later films would explore a number of different themes, including the blues with Crossroads, uh, some somewhat of a, of a, of a strange New York musical with Streets of Fire, um, but also a, a, re- a revisionist western that may have seemed as though it were um, stunt casting with three different sets of brothers, the Carradines, the Quades, the Guests, and um, there might have been another group, the Keeches, so four different, Stacey and James Keech, Randy and, Randy and Dennis Quaid, um, David Carradine, John Carradine, Robert Carradine, and uh, Christopher, and I think William Guest. Uh, anyway, um, very good film, very good film, uh, The Long Riders. But I wanted to, I wanted to try to find something that was a little less known, that was a little bit more under the radar, that that didn't meet the expectations that uh, of its of its original. Uh, release and um that film was 1989's american neo-noir crime thriller johnny handsome which it, it has a it has a silly little title but it's it really is a noir um it is a loser film about losers going up for for heights and what made this film interesting is that two things um a, a great a great supporting cast, including Ellen Barkin, Forrest Whitaker, Morgan Freeman, uh, Lance Henriksen, and Elizabeth McGovern. Um, all of them playing, playing, I guess, uh, arc trope roles in noirs. Uh, Ellen Barkin being a standout of playing a vicious, horrible woman that um, berates and later tries to seduce the lead character played by Mickey Rourke in a performance that I thought was very I thought it was very moving I thought it was tender and I thought it was sweet he um Rourke plays John Sedley a man who's um he's disfigured he has a face like well the best I can describe it is uh Rocky Dennis in in The Mask or um not not Matt in the Peter Bogdanovich film Mask where um Eric, Eric Stoltz played uh, the real-life disfigured, deformed kid, Rocky Dennis, his mother, um, Cher, and um, f- 
father figure, stepfather, somewhat Sam Elliott. Just, you know, a film that when I watched it again, I wasn't really impressed so much by it, but, um, you know, exceptional performances. But what is interesting here is it's that same kind of an idea where there is a young man with facial disfigurement and he's grown up on the outskirts of society, foster homes, he's grown up as somebody who has constantly been berated and abused, have been shit upon, and he has very little, um, he has very little going for him in the, in the sense of being able to depend on any other person, so what ends up happening is that he finds himself, he finds himself struggling to fit into a society, and um, he turns to he turns to one of the things that only that, that seems to be a, a a profitable future for him, and that's crime. So he um, the beginning of the story, he's going to bat for a friend of his, Mikey, played by um, you know in a, in a small role played by the great Scott Wilson that you remember from. Um, the Walking Dead, I think, the season where they were on the prison, or no, the season where they were on the farm and then in the prison, Scott Wilson, but also um, the Clutter Family movie about, um, uh, my God, the Robert Blake film, Robert Blake, Scott Wilson as the murderers of that Utah, fa of that Kansas City family um, in cold blood, in cold blood. Great film if you haven't had a chance with an exceptional performance by both Scott Wilson or John Forsythe, but all, but, but incredibly powerful by Robert Blake. If you get a chance, that's on the Criterion Collection. I don't, I can't recall what's fine, but in this film, he plays a sort of father figure, good guy, or at least as good as a character like that could be who's, who's mired in that world. He takes care of Johnny, he's his only friend. There is a sense of camaraderie between the two of them. There's a sense of love that exists in, in some ways where uh, the Mike character um, looks after, watches over his surrogate son. But uh, he is a man beset by demons. Uh, and they're never made clear whether it's uh, uh, drinking, gambling, women, whatever, he owes mo he either owes money or he needs money, and um, career criminals find themselves sometimes in these situations digging into dangerous, dangerous partnerships. Um, they hook up with Lance Henriksen as Rafe Garrett and Ellen Barkin as Sonny Boyd in really two, two performances that could be considered way over the top if the film wasn't as dedicated and committed to the world that it creates. It creates this world um, where the Lance Hendrickson character can go above and beyond and be the, 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 true, the true evil that Lance Hendrickson is able to achieve in this type of film. I mean, this is a, this is a B-movie and it's um it's a it's a great B movie. It really it really shows what was possible when you had um, smarmy material that was well written and got into a true understanding of what these characters would experience. There is a there is a heist, a, a rare coin heist at the beginning of the film, and it's, it's it's exciting and it's it's full of it's full of it's full of action and movement and attention that you would see throughout Walter Hill's career, and which I felt was sadly missing for, from Dead for a Dollar, which is one of the reasons that I had such a well such a problem with it, and and I found it difficult to really. Um, a sell out to I for you know I think the biggest problem with that film was that I couldn't I couldn't bring myself to really embrace what I was watching um it didn't feel lived in it didn't feel real um there was a there was a sense of everything being too a little bit too clean a little bit too nice so uh, so so as such the film itself lacked in a in a degree of of danger 
I can't say that for Johnny Handsome. Johnny Handsome is a dangerous film. It's a it's a it's a film about bad people doing bad things, and it's a very it's a very contrived way of putting it. But I think it's I think it's pretty accurate for um, B movie descriptions where where you want to see something that's fast and fast and mean. Um, the people who are in it, the people in it are not good. They're not they're not. Uh, you know, Ellen Barkin. What was great about Ellen Barkin's character is she is pure evil. She's not a Barkin. Barkin argued with uh, the director Walter Hill about even taking the role because Walter wanted her to know that it might not be a good move for her because the character was so was is such a horrible, horrible woman. And Barkin argued that when else is she going to get some get to play somebody so horrible? who is horrible for the sake of being horrible. There's no there's no trauma in her backstory. She wasn't molested by a father or an uncle. She wasn't beaten. There, none of that none of that comes out in, in one of these um, dramatic scenes where you where she begs for her life or she tries to she tries to get sympathy for her behavior. No, she's a fucking horrible human being who is sadistic in a way that she simply enjoys mocking, hurting, and shitting on the Mickey Rourke character, a disabled man, a man whose face is somewhat like a lion, somewhat like, you know, um, a great deal of it looks like um, the Ron Perlman character from from um, Beauty and the Beast, the, the CBS series that ran in the, the mid-80s. Um, and Rourke, Rourke is... The interesting thing about an actor like Jim, Mickey Rourke is that he's always been able, he has a certain star power, but he also has a sensitivity and a vulnerability that comes out in the films. You would see it later on in The Wrestler. You would see it in, um, you would see it somewhat in A Prayer for the Dying and, and, and the Chinatown movie that he did with Michael Cimino, um, The Year of the Dragon. Uh, there, there, were, there were elements to him that really really make you take notice of the struggle that's going on within the character that he's playing and I think perhaps maybe Mickey Rourke brings some of that to to the performance based on his own life I don't know there seems to be a lot of turmoil there um the you know one of my my favorite performances in Angel Heart where he plays um the detective that is just you know completely out of his depth completely completely unprepared for the evil that he is unleashing he's going through but um, back to this film this is this is vintage this is Walter Hill at the peak of his powers this is uh, after 48 hours after Red Heat um, before the films that would take him into the 1990s including Undisputed and Geronimo and American Legend I mean this is a guy that really did some incredible work throughout the, the late 70s. I mean, the man did Hard Times, Southern Comfort, The Warriors. The Warriors alone is is a film that, that people embrace for its comic book craziness and its its level of commitment to the world that it creates. It is a it is a, an incredible transplanting, I think, of the, the Ulysses story um, of, of this gang who is being who's being hunted across the city for a murder, for the murder of a gangland leader that they did not commit. And so, you know, what's great about what Hill does is that he perfectly creates these worlds that this kind of thing can exist in. And Johnny Handsome has elements of that where, you know, the the criminal underworld, the, the backbiting, um shit upon untrustworthy shit untrustworthy um, partnerships that need to be made in certain cases because that's the pan that's the manpower that's the setup this is what's needed um, you know it's interesting this is not a film like heat this is not a professional type of um, where you watch it you can imagine this actually taking place this is a fairy tale land this is an extreme example of criminality and criminal subcultures um, something about it just feels as such whereas something like Michael Mann's Heat 
feels natural, real. It feels like, like it exists in the world. This is more of um, a pure fictional story that comes out of the tropes of 1940s and 50s B-movie film noirs. And, you know, Walter Hill described this as a noir, as a 90s, as a, as a late 80s noir film that should have been made in black and white, although the problem was he didn't have the clout and he didn't have a cast that could sell that kind of thing. Although, I mean, I don't understand the struggle that people have with fucking black and white, but it does seem to be something that they can't wrap their fucking heads around and um, will not allow themselves to experience. It's it's fucking crazy. But I can see where a lot of this would have been a much better film. The smoke would have felt better. Fog would have felt better. There would have been, there would have been scenes where you could have played with shadows in a way. Um, last night I was at my mom's house and I was watching... Uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, the the original 30s film with um, um, Frederick Marsh, directed by La, uh, Robert Mamoulian. And I didn't care for the film completely. It was a little bit overdramatic for me, and the acting was a little bit... It was a little bit too... It was a little bit too pronounced and theatrical for me, but there was that final scene where, where Hyde is being chased through the streets of London, I, I believe London, and Mamoulian is playing with the shadows, and it's it's just, there's something about shadows in black and white that cannot be replicated in the same way in color. I think the only time that I've ever seen it even attempted and, 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 and somewhat successful was um, in Angel Art, the, the shot of the elevator. The, the gated elevator going down and the way the light kind of played but it was it was also shot in darkness and with such a with such a um a dead color palette that it did look like they were shooting color for black and white and i've heard a number of filmmakers um in one instance there's a there's a documentary i can't remember there's a documentary running on amazon prime right now where um cinematographers talk about the art of cinematography and they were talking about making um, 1984 the Richard Burton, John Hurt uh, adaptation of the George Orwell novel. And they were talking about how they, they had a special film process in which it, it, would, it would dilute the colors and it would, it would, it would just make them like, like closer to the grayscale. So it was, as close as, it was as close to black and white as you could get while still remaining a color picture. And I think this film could have benefited from something like that, although the studios have their say and let's be honest audiences audiences tend not to like black and white and they don't like uh foreign languages with subtitles for whatever reason call it the lazy american uh attitude but there is something there that that you know keeps the keeps the the culture from really experience artistic really experiencing artistic excellence and I think with a film like this with with such a lurid um, material with such a, a downbeat ending um, and I'm not going to talk too much about that that we're just gonna this is this is this is a fatalistic movie it's a noir so when you watch noir you know this is not going to end well for the good guy for whoever the protagonist is for whoever it is that you're rooting for to 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 win at the end it's not going to play out in that manner because it is a world filled with losers and losers have to suffer all the way to the end and that's one of the things that i really truly admire about walter hill's film and and something that i felt was in very lacking in Dead for a Dollar. It, there wasn't a commitment to making the world real. There wasn't a commitment to the the conversation between the conversation and the vocabulary and the, and the dialogue between people um, in a way that that was very powerful in 48 Hours in this film, in Southern Comfort, in, in Hard Times. There was, seemed to be a more natural and realistic, um, you know, albeit offensive, description of people, uh, cultures, a place, and scene. Um, personally, I love that kind of thing because I think it reflects, I think it reflects the world uh, more, more accurately. I like, I don't, I don't go to a film for complete 
accuracy. I wouldn't enjoy the John Wick films as much as I do if that were the case. But I do like the fact that there is an attempt to create something dreamlike in a, in a realistic setting so there's something relatable to it. The world is an ugly place. It's, it's filled with a lot of um, it's filled with a lot of savagery um, very little compassion. I'm watching right now I'm watching um, an HBO series that ran a few years back that I don't know if it was cancelled, I don't know exactly what happened to it, I do know that there were struggles with, with some of the actors, but um, I'm watching David Simon's The Deuce, which is about uh, the sex industry in 1970s New York City, from from the street hustlers, pimps, whores, through the cops that patrol the area, the massage parlors, and ultimately into the, to the burgeoning porno industry, which has overtaken everything that we are at this point and, and does so in such a way that is both exciting and disgusting in equal measure. So um, I'm, I got one episode left in the, la in the first season and I'm really looking forward to how this plays out. One of the things that I love um, But one of the things that I love about this type of storytelling is that I, I think I think when you see a film that really goes against the grain and delivers a sad or negative ending, I think that's a much braver thing because number one, I think life I think life plays out like that more often more often than not. And there are sad stories to be tell, told. And when they get shortchanged, when a ribbon is, is tied, when there is a happy ending, um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you could argue with, uh, you could argue that Tony Scott's true romance betrayed um, Quentin Tarantino's original concept, in which the Clarence character dies in that film, and Alabama goes on to 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 love him, but. There is a sense that the, that the film that Tony Scott, Tony Scott created was um, a fairy tale, and that you wanted you wanted the couple to win at the end. If they were going to suffer as much as they did, there was a sense of a reward that sh that that could realistically be paid at the end of the movie. So um, I think Tony Scott sells it beautifully, and I think it really works in that particular film. That being said, in a film like Johnny Handsome, for everybody to walk away from it um, with a sense of justice, revenge, with with Johnny, with John being able to overcome his disabilities and how should you say it, Monte Cristo, these cocksuckers who left him for dead who sent him to Angola prison where he was, you know, shanked and left for dead. Um, it would have been, I guess a part of me would have said it would have been nice to, to, to see the character kill all those that had done him wrong and to walk away much better. But that wouldn't be true to the noir and so this film is definitely set up with a bleak overall feeling to it so to suddenly try to put a happy ending in would, would betray the very mood and the rhythms of the story but what this film does is a little bit interesting because it, you know we've seen a th we've seen a hundred betrayals we've seen a hundred uh, heist films that go sideways you know payback point blank the the Italian job, everybody's always getting fucked in these kinds of things and left for dead, and they come back. And the interesting thing with what this film is, is that the Mickey Rourke character Johnny Johnny, um, after being mocked all of his life, given the nickname Johnny Handsome, um, he undergoes experimental surgery in prison after he's been after he's been knifed. In, um, in a cotton field by two men who were offered a thousand dollars in cigarettes to do it. Um, Johnny is given the opportunity to have surgery on his face 
in a very good performance by by a gentle and sweet Forrest Whitaker as the prison doctor, prison prison surgeon, prison psychiatrist. I don't know. It looks like he's got a couple of different hats. I'm not sure exactly how that works out, but it works out in the in the text of the film. Um, he saves Johnny from himself. He gives him that opportunity. And there are moments when Mickey Rourke's character, where, where Johnny slowly starts to recover from the surgeries, and the mouth starts working a little bit different, differently. He has to learn how to speak again, to speak because he he has a he has a a muffled type of vocal vocal sound. He has a, a muffled talking voice, and it, it's very difficult to understand him. It's it's almost like a growl, like a low growl that he's he's just kind of growling out the words, and he has to learn to speak again. And the Forrest Whitaker character is obviously a bleeding heart, feels that he could help him, has looked into his past, wants to go to, um, needs Johnny in order to move forward and get parole and give him a new life. He needs him to go into counseling, and there are moments, but what what Mickey Rourke does is so genuine and real, and I think he was really one of the exceptional actors. It truly is a shame to see what what he did to himself and um, the 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 problems that he underwent in the in the nineties. There was a reviewer when writing his review about Rourke's comeback film, the rest of the Aronofsky film about Randy Randy the Ram. Um, and they described it as there was a scene where Randy is walking through the woods with a hood on and you can see his face and you can see the puffed up bad plastic surgery that has overwhelmed Mickey Rourke over the over the last few decades and the writer was the critic was was calling back to Johnny Handsome and how so much of that stuck with him and and how it was almost like a reverse where we're the wrestler was was Johnny Johnny after Johnny becoming Mickey Rourke becoming Johnny instead of Johnny Hanson where you have this you have this Randy the Ram looking figure with the help of plastic surgery becoming a handsome some might say beautiful man I mean Mickey Rourke was a very good looking man in the 80s You, what I, I guess what I'm saying is that, and this is not, this is not any skill on Walter Hill's part or the writers, because how could you know that all of that's going to play into it? There is a sense that, that, um, Walter Hill creates this dark world where there's a sliver of hope and the hope is is honest and realistic and I like that it's there I really do I really there are moments in this film where I just feel um, there is truth telling there is there is there is magic on that screen and it's it's very strange because I'm watching it and I see the the evolution of of Walter Hill's style he uses a lot of fisheye lenses and close-ups not not necessarily close-ups but like he pulls the camera in close so you see a character, um, for example, the the shopkeeper in the first heist, and he's shot with these full head fisheye angles, fisheye lenses that 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 warp the surround the surrounding image, but but make the character bigger than life. And he does that again in another forty eight hours, and he's done it a few times in, in, I think he did it in Red Heat a couple of times, so um, it's not something that I particularly care for, but um, those are camera angles, that, that's, that's camera work that sometimes takes me a little bit out of what I'm watching, but what, what's really compelling about this film are the performances. Um, Rourke is, Rourke's loser character, the good doctor, that is, you know, a lot of this are just obvious tropes, 
um, Ellen Barkin as, as a disgusting, horrible, very sexy, but disgusting and horrible human being that lives to, to taunt, mock him. Um, but also when he comes back into their lives, not revealing to them who he is the attraction that she has to him, the idea that she's going to... She is a scorpion. That is her nature, and she will take advantage of a situation in order to do right for herself and go against her, um, her partner, Rafe. Now, Hendrickson is wonderful. Hen Hendrickson, Hendrickson is always Hendrickson. He's almost like a low-rent Christopher Walken. Um, I just don't think he ever got the parts that he... I don't think he got the... Op I don't think he got the opportunity to be... In bigger films, he was the best thing about a lot of B and B and C D level movies. He was he was wonderful in so many things. His just crowning achievement, obviously, being Aliens, and that's arguable. But I think, I think for my money, he's his Bishop is is a brilliant, brilliant performance. There's, there's a lot of heart and soul there without there being um, anthropomorphizing the character. I, you know, we'll get into that one on another time. Um, Elizabeth McGovern is the good girl that is, that is trying to do everything that she can to save his life. But the thing about this film, the relationship in this film that makes you, that at least made me really, um, really buy into it and really take every aspect of it, um, was Morgan Freeman as... I don't know if the character is... I don't know if the character is a... Um, is a parole officer or just a cop. He's a... He's an enforcement officer. He, he's an officer. Um, he busted Johnny. He's, he's known Johnny. And he... You know, there's this attitude. There's this... There's this kind of... Menacing... Truth to Morgan Freeman's portrayal. And this is before Morgan Freeman became God, before he became the benevolent character that um, that could do no wrong, that was sought after to to make audiences feel good about black representation in films, where, where this is, he's, he's the president, he's God, he's the doleful... No, this is... This is a decent cop who doesn't trust the situation but is not breaking Johnny down. He's just letting him know, I'm, I'm here, I'm waiting. I'm just gonna wait this thing out. I'm gonna wait for you to fuck up and I'm gonna be there when you do fuck up. And he shows a certain level of benevolence at the end when he gives Johnny the opportunity to finish out what was before him, his mission, his purpose. Um, He's a lawman. He has no. He has no illusions. He has no, no. He's not under the impression that Johnny has become the better man, and it's that performance, that relationship, that really drives this film for me. It's the, sometimes that's what you need to look for. What I will say in this short episode, I just wanted to put something out um, in addition, a, a supplemental episode because because Dead for a Dollar, although a decent film, still disappointed me, and I wanted to go into something. I could have talked, I could have spoken about Hard Times, The Driver, Forty Eight Hours, but I wanted to find something that maybe maybe other people weren't as aware of. I think this is. A wonderful little film. I think it's a great little B noir, ugly, um, just um, bad people doing bad things, and there's no fear in it. The film is not afraid of the subject matter, and this is what I always loved about Hill, and it's what was sorely missing from Dead for a Dollar. So. If you get a chance and you can find it, if you can look for it, I'm not sure where it's playing. I have a, I have a Blu-ray copy and it's wonderful. So, if you get a chance, take a look at Johnny Handsome from 1989. Mickey Rourke, Ellen Barkin, Elizabeth McGovern, Morgan Freeman, Forrest Whitaker, 
Scott Wilson and the great Lance Henriksen. I don't think you'll be disappointed. There's, there's a lot to unwrap here, and it's just a suggestion. I wanted to throw it out in the supplemental episode. So for those of you who are... Um, constant listeners i'm I, you know i wish this could be a longer episode but i gotta take care of the puppy right now so um i just want you guys to know that our hearts are with you you know if you've listened to us over the years if you're new to the podcast if you'd like to support us you can click on um you can click on buymeacopy.com slash watch rick ramos and um you can give whatever or you don't have to give we do this because we love it, and we appreciate you listening and coming back to it. So that's where we're at. We hope you're well. Be good, and we will, uh, we will talk soon. Bye-bye.